welcome again to Sunday School. We're continuing our uh, present course on the New Covenant and the covenant theology, that is. And this morning, the idea that we're going to get to eventually down a few minutes here is on the New Covenant. But to understand the New Covenant, I think it's important for us to go back and review a little bit, which I think sometimes review helps us remember better than getting into the new material. And it's important in covenant theology to do a review to keep in mind where we're going and what God's up to. Now, once again, on the board here, I've just in a sketchy form listed the most important covenant, which is the covenant of redemption. This is the covenant where Jesus and the Godhead and God and the Holy Spirit all agreed that Jesus would be a sacrifice before the foundation of the earth, before the foundation of the world. Now, of course, the Old Testament people didn't know that. The New Testament people did and wrote about that in the New Testament and Peter and Revelation and Timothy. They didn't know about it necessarily, but we know about it. And we know that in this covenant, Jesus was designated to die uh, before the foundation of the world, before there was sin, before there was a fall, before there was creation. And we also know when Paul wrote, after he read the Old Testament, he wrote Ephesians and said that the chosen people of God would elect in God would be chosen before the foundation of the world as well. So God's plan is plan A. There's never a plan B. It's always the original plan that God was going to have a people that he was going to choose out of the world and that his son would be a sacrifice for those people, indicating and implying that there would be a fall. He knew there was going to be a fall. That was not going to be a secret to him. And we don't need to go into the philosophy of all that because of our short nature of the course. So when he created the world, then he created man, very good, and he put Adam in the, in the garden, as you recall, and he gave Adam a perfect life, if you will. And Adam had the law written on his heart. He was in covenant with God at that point. He knew God was a creator. He knew God had given him everything that, that he had, and he knew that there were stipulations to keep that. And the main stipulation God gave him was don't eat of the tree. And that was just to establish who was God and who was man, who was creature and who was creator. And who and how was Adam going to be loyal to God? Was he going to be loyal to God or not? Well, we know that from biblical history that he decided that he wanted to be his own man and he sinned against God and fell. And when that happens, you can't be in the presence of God. God can't He's established the fact that you have to be perfect to be in a relationship with him. And that's what the covenants are all about, you recall. The covenants are about relationship. A covenant is an agreement between parties that will establish a relationship. And the relationship God wanted at Adam was to be established based upon God, who he was in the law, and Adam in the image of God, which should have kept that law perfectly. They could have had a perfect, harmonious relationship like they did before the fall. Well, as you know, Adam fell. But because of this covenant, God wasn't going to let that fall interrupt his ultimate plan to have a people that would worship him. And so he implemented at that point the plan that was planned all along, covenant of grace, where he would in some way send the seed of a woman someday that would return this harmonious relationship back to its original position. Uh, he, he promised that a seed of the woman would come and defeat the seed of the serpent and restore divine human relationship. Now, the covenants then are evolved that redemptive history as we go down the line in these covenants to reestablish that relationship. And God doesn't do it all at once. It's a progress. It's a historical progress that he gives us so we can count on him. We know he's truthful. We know his promises will always come true. Plus, he's got to develop this nation, this, these people. This is going to be a, millions of people that are going to be in his kingdom someday in worship. And that takes time to develop. You just don't have a million people overnight. So the historical evolvement of these covenants gives us a, if you will, a, a, a scaffold of how God's going to do this. And right away, after Adam sinned, he establishes his covenant of grace with the seed of the woman. And then he establishes a covenant with Noah where he promises to preserve his creation. And we're going to see this a little bit later in Jeremiah. He promises to preserve the creation he created, even though he flooded it at a point to get rid of the seed of the serpent. The seed of the serpent morphed unbelievably after the fall. And the seed of the woman was threatened. And so he wiped out uh, a lot of those uh, serpent seeds, if you will, all of them except for uh, Noah and his family. 
And he began again, and then he would get to the covenant of Abe, where he starts to call out these people. He calls out Abe out of the a heathen world, out of the land of idolatry, where he was an idolater. And he, through his spirit, he regenerates Abraham, and then he will start to evolve these people that he talked about back here in Ephesians. This is the beginning of that kingdom people, the beginning of the rudimentary church, if you will. And with the Abrahamic covenant, he promised that he would have a people, a large number of people, like stars in the universe, sand in the sea. He's going to have a place. He would give Abraham a holy land, a place for those people, which would imply a kingdom. He would also be in his, he would be in their presence. And he would manifest that early on through the tabernacle and the temple and through the altars, as you recall from last week. When, he, when Adam sinned, God established right away with the covenant of redemption that required a sacrifice to come into his presence. So that's important to remember. Now, as Abraham's seed grows over 400 years in Egypt, these, this people that God has called out initially as a type, uh, is oppressed by Egypt, by the seed of the serpent, if you will, and God hears their moaning, hears their crying, and he calls them out of Egypt and takes them to Mount Sinai through Moses, a mediator. Now, this is the important covenant that we want to we'll allude to today. It's called the Mosaic Covenant, and it's important from the standpoint is God now is elaborating on what it takes to be in his presence. He's taking the law that was on the heart of Adam, and it was on the heart of these early people, which they rejected, and now he's put it in writing as a constitution for his people. And last week we looked over that and the Mosaic covenant in reality is a covenant that tells who God is. This is who I am. I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't commit, you know, all these uh, attributes of him in this law form covenant is a reflection of who God is. And we see all these laws in the Torah, the book of the covenant, the book of the, of, of the law. And these laws are established once again, when he called Israel out, he wanted them to be a holy nation and a priesthood and in his image. They were called a son of God, you recall. He told Pharaoh to release my son so they can come and worship me. So these, this nation was supposed to represent God as a witness nation to bring other people into this uh, relationship with God for blessing. So he is establishing this through the Mosaic law. He tells them who he is and who they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to act. And this is important because they don't do that eventually. And in this law, he also gives them the cultic system, which was post-fall, you recall, in order to come into relationship with God, there had to be a sacrifice. And this cultic system with the different offerings, the burnt offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, all these offerings were designed to cover over the Old Testament sin that the sinners of the Old Testament committed so that they could once again come into the vicinity of the tabernacle or the temple to be in the presence of God and to stay within the camp. If a person did not offer the sacrifice or was unclean or didn't do what was appropriate, he had to be excluded from the camp and he couldn't come into the vicinity of the tabernacle. Now in the fall, after the fall, and in this particular rudimentary form of relationship, God's name was in the Holy of Holies and they knew he was there and they knew he was their God, but it wasn't the intimate relationship that they had with Adam or that we have now. But in order to maintain that relationship, they had to maintain their sacrificial system. And this had to be done from the heart. They just couldn't go in and throw animals on there like a rabbit foot and expect to have good luck. They had to be repentant when they did this. And the Day of Atonement, when the two goats came in, all the sin for all the years, the people confessed to God with their sacrifices that were accumulated in the tabernacle or the temple, the day of atonement would clean out that tabernacle and then they would start over year after year after year. So this system that allowed in the post-fall era for them to stay in contact or in the presence of God. And that's extremely important to remember as we go through here. That's the important part of the Mosaic covenant, what's called the cultic system, the sacrificial system. God also established the civil laws, as you recall, the clean and the unclean rules and things like this, which would set them apart from the other nations. So people would know they were different. And when they saw how they were different, how God blessed them, that was a means of witness. Same thing today with the church. We're, we're called to be set apart and holy. We have also have the law. And the law we keep is the law of love, basically. And the, most of the, all the laws can be summarized under the first and second commandment or the first commandment which is the Shema, which they were to remember. 
And when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest law? It was Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor. Keep those two, you keep all the others. So the law was very important. The moral law, civil law, and the cultic law. So that's the Mosaic covenant, which is the one that is most prominent in the Old Testament. So the Mosaic covenant was in place and they were established as a nation at Mount Sinai. They were given all this information and they were told then to go to the land that I promised you. You've you now got a constitution, you've got a bill of rights, you've got a mediator, uh, you've got everything you need to be my holy nation and my priesthood. And away they went. Well, that first generation, as you recall, didn't do very well because they hadn't experienced God to the extent in Egypt and they may not have had the belief that they should have had and they didn't trust God, didn't have the faithfulness that they should. And as you recall, they didn't believe the two spies that, were, that said they could do it, Joshua and Caleb. And so they wandered in the desert for 40 years until they died off. And the new generation, probably which experienced God in the desert, had the manna and the water and the sandals that never wore out and all this, had a trust of God. And when they came to the Holy Land then and crossed over in, in Jericho. And before they did, you recall, last from last week, Moses repeated the law in Deuteronomy. Now, Deuteronomy is a covenant book, if you will. It's, it's got just all kind of uh, law in it. And he repeated the Ten Commandments and repeated all the other casuistic laws, the do's and don'ts, which we told. And God warned them over and over and over and over in Deuteronomy, chapter after chapter, obey the law for your own good. That's what you should do. So they, they had it. They knew it. That first generation knew it. And they went across into the Holy Land. God told them to wipe out the Canaanites, just like it was a kind of a, another judgment, like the flood on the evil people that were there for 400 years. To a certain extent, they obeyed. They, they did a fairly good mop-up job, but they left some there. And these Canaanites who were left there then continued their pagan worship. And in time, as you recall, we went through the period of Judges, and we get into First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. The people had this gyration relationship with God. You know, they, they, in Judges, they would get in a mess and God would send a judgment and they'd cry out and God would send a judge or a deliverer, if you will. That's what the judge was. And they would come back in the relationship. Another gener so we see this pattern on and again, off again. And to a certain extent, a large part of that was because they didn't have good leadership. They didn't have a Moses with them or a Joshua with them or a king with them. At the end of Judges, we see the, the refrain, the people didn't have a king, so they did what was right in their own eyes. It was a postmodern culture. They just didn't have any, any direction, even though they had the law. Nobody was telling them about it. Nobody was reading them. The Levites weren't preaching and teaching like they should. Matter of fact, they were going out and starting their own churches. So by the time we get to Samuel, Samuel comes along. God provides him as a, as a leader to kind of correct things a little bit. He's a, one of the first prophets and also a priest. And we see God finally, uh, he, he promised back in Deuteronomy you'd have a king. And this is, we see the beginning of the Davidic covenant here with this covenant that God would have a king. And obviously, if he promised Abraham, remember, that he would have a great nation. And he promised Abraham kings would come from him. And if you're going to have a great nation, you need a land. If you're going to have a great nation, you need a king. So this is how the covenant continues to evolve. God's got a great number of people now that he told he would call out. He's got a king that he's raising up. He's got a place he's put him in. So now he's got a place. He's got a people. And he's got a tabernacle that he's established. So he has a presence with him. So everything's going according to plan. David comes along. He's a great king. He's a warrior. God doesn't let him build a temple for that reason. David commits sin, as you recall, just like we do. And David was very repentant, as you recall. And God he forgave him. He, David was, you know, we hear the refrain that God says, David was a man after my heart. Well, that's because David was earnestly repentant for his sin, which is important in regard to the cultic system. If the people had been truly repentant of their sin, when they went to offer the sacrifice, that wouldn't have been a problem. But the, as we see, we'll see in a second, that becomes a problem down the road. Now, as, as time goes on, Solomon becomes the king. And when David dies off, and Solomon starts off like gangbusters. He's a type of Christ here. He shows us how he's going to take care of his people by distributing the funds equally and make, taking care of the widows and the orphans, which is if you're taking care of the widows and the orphans, you're taking care of everybody from there on up. That's why they use that phrase. So Solomon was doing a great job. 
he, he didn't ask for wealth or wisdom. It, I mean, for wealth or, or popularity or control, he asked for wisdom to take care of the people. And what, a, what better thing to ask for, how to take care of God's people. So Solomon was doing fine until he starts a building program and starts needing more money. And he, he, all of a sudden people start flooding him with gold in chapter 10 of 2 Kings. And he, 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 it's on a slippery slope. The wealth got him. And Jesus, remember, says it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom because that starts to that starts to grip you. And in order to maintain that wealth and get that more gold, he starts marrying other women. And these other women bring in their idols from their perspective kingdoms. And all of a sudden, Solomon's sitting up high places and altars to these other gods, principally Baal, which was a principal god in Mesopotamia. It was a fertility god that the people thought that if you worship Baal and did certain things that it would cause rain and cause the crops to grow. And the people started looking at Baal and said, well, gee, we better worship Baal too. And in addition to God, to make sure we got all our bases covered so our grapes will grow. And so they started slipping off into Baal worship and worship of Kamush and all these other different gods. And remember, this is ambiguous language to us. It's Old Testament language, but the principle is the same. They slipped into idolatry because they forgot what God had done for him. They forgot the Exodus story. Solomon didn't perpetuate the information he should have. And then, so what happens eventually when people don't get the information, the knowledge they need, they start to slip into false worship. And this is the most critical thing we have to keep in mind. Satan did that with Eve, false worship. And the church in the Old Testament went into false worship with these false gods. And after Solomon died, Rehoboam, his son, you know, started raising taxes to, to fund his kingdom. And there's a rebellion and Jeroboam split, went and started the northern tribes and he set up a golden calf. You know, he didn't want people going down to Jerusalem. They would start going back to Rehoboam. And he wanted people to see their God. And so when he set up this golden calf, this was perpetuated down the road in addition to the other gods of the land. So we have all these different temples and high places and people worshiping these gods. They're doing everything except the Shema. They weren't worshiping the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, and all their mind. They were splitting a little bit and worshiping this God here and this God here. Instead of coming to church or coming to the tabernacle on Sunday morning with their whole hearts on God, they had their iPhone they were playing with there. They had their computer they were playing with. They were thinking about what they were going to do after church. You see, they weren't there in their whole heart. God saw that. He knew it was going to happen. And so as the years went by, the, the kings got worse. They taxed the people more. They, they wanted more money. They wanted more control. They wanted more power. The, the people got more greedy. The, the, the rich got richer. The poor got poor. The people weren't taken care of. It makes me think a minute about the nativity scene when Mary went to the inn pregnant. What did the people of the inn? They didn't care about that. They didn't care about a pregnant woman. Women were discarded. Babies were discarded. Mary, they didn't give up a room in the inn. They wanted their room. They wanted their thing. They sent Mary out to the stable, pregnant woman. So that tells you something. And not only that, but children weren't valued at all. They were sacrificed to the idols of the land. And it's no different today. Through abortion, we're sacrificing babies as well to, to the altar of sexual immorality. So nothing changes much. And that's what I was trying to get you to see a while ago. So here we have this slide into sin. I mean, God must have been absolutely, he, he couldn't have been madder, I don't think, after seeing all these babies chucked into a fire. He couldn't have been madder seeing women treated the way they were. He couldn't have been madder seeing men abusing everybody. He couldn't be madder seeing all this stuff happening. And his chosen people, we're not any better than the people of the land. And God told them back in Deuteronomy in the curse section, if you start acting like them, you're going to get vomited out. But nobody was telling them. Nobody was teaching them. The kings weren't paying any attention to the sacred scriptures. So that's what happens. A slippery slope, right on down you go. So as time went on and the kings got worse and they started making alliances with other people, trusting the military strength of other people, not the God that took them out of the Exodus and defeated Pharaoh, God sent the prophets, as we talked about last week. These prophets were sent out to tell the people to come back to God repentantly. Come back to your God, you know. And the prophets, they didn't have a nice message. A lot of their language was very harsh and straightforward, and a lot of them were killed. And there were a lot of prophets, not just the writing prophets we talked about, but Elisha had a school of prophets that he 
that watched him as he took on Elijah's role. And Obadiah, another prophet in the Old Testament, not the one that wrote the book, Obadiah, protected hundreds of prophets from the uh, death threat that they had from Ahab and Jezebel. There was just a lot of prophets running around, a lot of unnamed prophets in addition to the few that we have. And the few that we have are enough for us to get a grasp of what God was mad about, which I was been speaking about and they would go to the people for hundreds of years in there to try to call them back god was extremely patient and long-suffering and to some extent this is why we have the scriptures to show us how patient god is not only patient with them patient with us he's long-suffering and his mercy is new every morning it's tender his grace is overwhelming and we're to see this as we look at the scripture he wasn't a god of wrath he was a god of grace to put up with all this stuff and so eventually he got fed up and he warned them, but the judgment that was coming was not the ultimate judgment. It was not ultimate wrath. When we look at the prophets, we see scattered out in all of them vestiges of rudimentary hope in there that God was going to do something down the road because sin was not going to have the last word. Judgment was not the finality. Judgment was a means of salvation down the road. Judgment was a mean of, means of discipline to get rid of the seed of the serpent that had infiltrated into the Israeli camp. And the people, the remnant, would be taken up in that judgment, but they would be okay eventually because they would end up with God in heaven. And the same thing today, when we see things happening today, like 9-11, for example, when these 3,000 people were killed, a lot of those people were unbelievers, and a lot of them were believers. The unbelievers are going to go where they were going to go originally, the believers are going to go where they're going to go originally. So whenever God brings the judgment, there's that double edge there. So when he brings judgment on Israel, it wasn't necessarily to eradicate them, it was to discipline them and purify them, get them away from all these idols and all these things that they weren't supposed to be doing. So in 722, God sent, raised up a nation by the name of Assyria, and that, Isaiah goes over that in chapter 8, 9, and 10 of his book, to discipline and take the 10 northern tribes into captivity, which he does. And Judah lasts a little longer, as you recall, uh, and God raises up a nation called Babylon and in 586 and about three different times, Judah goes into captivity. Daniel is one of the captives that goes in the first deportation. So God in his wisdom and in his mercy put his people into captivity. And when they went into captivity that final time, and this is ironic, but in 2 Kings chapter 24 or 25, if you look at it, when Nebuchadnezzar takes Israel, takes Judah out of uh, uh, the land, he takes them right back through Jericho. They went in through Jericho and they go out through Jericho. They went in with gold, they go out with, with all their gold taken, just like what happened in the Exodus. So we have Israel in the captivity. The 10 tribes just are dispersed, never to regain this side of the cross. Judah is going into captivity as well. And the prophets pro prophesied it. And predicted it but they also predicted as you recall in the different books cryptic messages of a future god always has hope so as we get to where we are today then that's a summary of where these covenants and all these covenants now are coming to a climax in the new covenant the new covenant is where all these covenants will be fulfilled okay and that's where we are in today's lesson the new covenant is is basically a climax of all the other covenants. It's a climactic event. And it's an extremely important covenant. It's what all the other covenants are pointing to. The new covenant is a fulfillment of all the other covenants. It's what God had planned back here. I'm going to have a people. God's going to be a sacrifice. Uh, there'll be a sacrifice which will occur and inaugurate the new covenant. This will inaugurate a new humanity, a new people, a new creation, a new heavens, a new earth. Already, not yet. But that's what the new covenant is going to do. And that's what all this was pointing to is the fulfillment of this back here. So you see the important thing in the New Testament, we see that. In the New Testament, we understand this. They didn't understand it. The prophets, Peter tells us, looked into these things, but they didn't understand them. Jeremiah looked into this per, uh, passage I'm going to look at in a minute, but he didn't understand it totally. We look back at it now and look at the beauty of it and see how God was, was evolving it. And so this new living way that he's coming up with, the new commands, uh, a new David, if you will, a new Moses, the Hebrews tells us, a new Moses, a new priesthood, uh, you know, all these things are going to start with the new covenant.
and it's God's grace. Now, the new covenant, this morning I want to capitalize a little bit on Jeremiah to talk about the new covenant. And in that, this passage we're going to look at, in chapter 31, I've uh, looked at previously, if you recall, but we're going to look at it again because it's extremely important. This is the chapter in the Bible that speaks of the new covenant, the only place it calls it the new covenant. And uh, when the disciples look back on this now, when Paul looks back on this and sees what's said here, that's how he can write a lot of his New Testament. So let's look at Jeremiah now. If you have your Bibles with you, it's pretty important to have them. And look at chapter 31 of Jeremiah. And let's go through this a little bit. So here the people are in captivity. We don't know exactly when Jeremiah was written, and I don't think they really know exactly who even who wrote it, but we're going to say Jeremiah did. And the people, now Moses wrote a lot of this stuff probably in the wilderness in the Torah, and the other books we're not sure, some of them. But the people would have had this information, especially New Testament people. And when the Old Testament people were in exile, remember, they went into exile. Daniel had this information because he, when he was in exile, he, he read about the 70 years that Jeremiah predicted. So Jeremiah should have been written to that point, that at, at the end of 70 years, the people would return to the, to the whole, to Jerusalem. So when people read this, they would have read about this new covenant. They would have read about this stuff, and they would have wondered what the world Jeremiah was talking about because it wasn't explained to them completely. It was in uh, cryptic form, sort of. And it was also, and for us, it's a little bit hard for us to understand it 100% too, unless somebody digs into some good commentaries and understands it, because it's written in language of that day. And that's, you know, the, the Old Testament language is not language we use today. So we have to have people help us interpret some of this language. But it was written in language that they would have understood when they read it. And we can understand today because we have means of figuring out what it means. So when we look at Jeremiah, I want to look, first of all, one of my favorite verses here in Jeremiah 31 is verse 22b. It's what I talked about. The Lord's going to create a new thing, a new creature, a new heaven, a new earth. A woman will surround a man. I think this alludes to Mary, if you will, surrounding Jesus. So here we have a seed, the proto-evangel, if you will, see the seed of the woman. We have the covenant of grace here. And we look, all the prophets have language like that. Isaiah is full of language of new creation and, and, and new heavens and new earth. If you look at the latter part of Isaiah. So, so if we go on here now, we're going to go down to verse uh, 30. So when Jeremiah writes this, keep in mind this particular section, 30 to 33, 30 to 32, is called the Book of Hope. Because if you study Jeremiah, you know the rest of the book is a book of judgment. It's, it's, it's not necessarily chronological, but it's talking about predictions of them going into exile by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon. And he jumps around a little bit, but that's what it's all about. It, 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 he really comes down on them. And one verse that I think is probably a good verse to keep in mind here is when he, when he tells them, look at Jeremiah 22, 8, 9, for example. This is finally, he, he says in chapter 22, verse 8. I think that's the verse I want. Yeah, verse 8. This is this judgment I was talking about. People from many nations will pass by this city and will ask one another, why has the Lord done this to this city? And the answer will be because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord and worship and served other gods. So this is where we are. They're in captivity. Jeremiah now has given them some, a, a little hope. And that's why this is called the book of hope right here in the middle of this devastation. The exile was devastating. And Habakkuk calls out, God, we need a revival. And God says, I'm sending Babylon. And back, what do you mean you're sending Babylon? It's evil people. Well, that's what he did. And so it was devastating to be taken into captivity by this evil, ruthless nation. So right here in the middle of this captivity, Jeremiah says, look, instead, everyone will, let's see, verse 30, verse 31, the time is coming. Okay, now this phrase, the time is coming, that's the future time. Okay, well, we know that what he's talking about here is the birth of Jesus. That's the time that's coming. Declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant 
So in other words, God's saying, these covenants, I'm going to make a new one. I'm going to make a new covenant, a better climactic covenant. Okay. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, what does he mean by that? At this particular point, there was no Israel. The tribes were scattered. So he's saying here, the time's coming when I'm going to bring my covenant people back together as a nation. Now, he's not speaking here of a geopolitical earthly kingdom. He's speaking here ambiguously saying, I'm going to bring all my people back together that Ephesians 1 was talking about. And this didn't happen at the return of the exile. Israel never, has ever, never the 10 tribes of Israel has never been reconstituted. So we, we see this language written in Old Testament form. They wouldn't have understood it at this point what God was talking about. He was talking about the church, the new Israel. But he wrote it in language they would understand. Oh, they would say to themselves, all Israel is going to come together. All the covenant community is going to come together. And they would have thought of it as a geopolitical earthly kingdom. But God's predicting a new covenant, a new humanity, a better situation. And that's what he's talking about here, a new covenant people, okay, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, you see, we alluded to this earlier, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers, okay? That's the Mosaic covenant. This is the important covenant. This is what the Old Old Testament, basically the majority of the Old Testament is talking about the old covenant with Moses. These covenants were pretty much in Genesis, but this covenant here encompasses uh, judges, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, right on through, because that covenant is a play on Deuteronomy. And the prophets went back and looked at Deuteronomy, and that's what they told the people they were supposed to obey the Mosaic covenant. And so that covenant they couldn't obey; they couldn't keep it. They, you know, they, they, you got to recall now when when God gave them the covenant, and He said. You know, keep the covenant. If you sin, go to the cultic system, make a sacrifice. Well, I don't know how, it's kind of funny because when you start doing things over and over and over, what happens eventually? It gets to be a routine. It gets to be something that you just do and you don't think about it. And that's kind of what happened here. They used the temple, they used the sacrifices as a means of gratifying God, if you will, as a means of maintaining what they thought would be a situation where God would always defend them no matter what. And they really didn't have their heart in it. And it, that's what was wrong with the old covenant. There was nothing wrong with the law itself. It was the people didn't understand it completely, how to keep it, what it meant. And they just kind of fool, fool around with it. And it's no different today. We're also in covenant with God. Now, I'm going to try to explain it as best way I can, but I don't want you to think I'm talking about a legalistic situation. When we come into the New Testament, and we also are in covenant with God in order to maintain a relationship with him. When God saves us and regenerates us and we become justified, a lot of people think, well, that's all there is to it. We're justified by faith. We're, we're saved. We don't have to worry about anything. We go do what we want. That's not true. Justification is a critical point but sanctification has to be included in here. Sanctification is also definitive, but also is progressive. God wants us to be like Israel in the sense that we were supposed to be a holy nation and a witness, and our sanctification is what establishes us as a witness as we keep God's law. And as we keep God's law, because we're in covenant with him, and he said, I've saved you by grace. Now, this is who you are. This is how I want you to act because you're a witness of mine. And Believe it or not, covenant keeping brings covenant blessing, just like it did for Israel. If we fall out of covenant with God and we disobey, even though we may be justified, our lives aren't exactly blessed. We can be filled with anxiety and lack of assurance, and we can be warriors. We, we don't trust God. We're not loyal to him because we haven't maintained our knowledge of him through the study of the scripture. So, even though we may be saved, we may not be happy, okay? So that's, and Paul alludes to that a little bit in Romans, doesn't he? I mean, what he wanted to do, he didn't do, and what he should do, he doesn't do, and woe is me, and I'm a mess, but he comes back to Christ, okay? So we got to remember that. We're still in covenant always, 
And the covenant just will delineate whether or not we're blessed or whether or not we're miserable. So there's nothing wrong with God's law. Paul said it's holy, just, and good. It tells us who we are, how we're to act, and it's good for us. But they couldn't keep it because they didn't have the spirit to empower them. So the old covenant, they broke. And I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant while I was a husband to them. So the Mosaic covenant over the years shows us that we're not, we can't keep the law. We're sinners. We need to make a sacrifice. We need something needs to come about to change this system because we can't keep that law, even though it's perfect, just, and good. So they need, they need a new covenant because that covenant didn't work. And it wasn't designed to work. The new covenant was the Mosaic covenant, even though it was a covenant under the covenant of grace, was still a conditional, unconditional. It was unconditional in that it showed them who they were and who God was and what they needed. But it was conditional because if they didn't keep it, God was going to send them out of the land, which is what he did. But he promises that he, there's going to be a better covenant. Okay, so verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with them, with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord. This is the covenant, but see what he says there. I will make. I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Notice I will. So what he's saying here now is... Jeremiah, even though the Old Testament people had the law of God on their hearts, okay, just like Adam did, sin had so clouded it, they couldn't, they couldn't obey it. And they didn't have the power to obey it at the time. They had, they had to have a mediator, they, you know, it, it was just a different setup for them, and they struggled with keeping the law. But this is the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. The new covenant people are going to be regenerated. God's going to put his law in their minds and on their hearts. In other words, the total person is going to have the law of God now in their heart, in their mind. Now keep that in mind. That's a regeneration. That's transformation. You become the new creature in the new heaven and the new earth. You dwell in the heavenlies now, although you're temporarily still on the earth. You're a new creature. And I, you know, uh, if you're like me, sometimes you don't you don't feel that necessarily, and you don't necessarily act that way. But you have to keep telling yourself that you're a new creature, you're a new man. The old man is dead. There's no more old man there. Some of his influences are still there. Some of the habits that you developed as the old man are still there, and they have to be broken because you're a new man and you're a new creature. That's what God says. He's going to write that on your heart. Your heart now has been circumcised. Moses predicted that back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, didn't he? That they, the day will come when the God will circumcise your hearts. And that's what circumcision was a foretaste of. So now this is, a, this is a real good one right here. God says, I will be their God and they will be my people. So God is going to create a new people and he is going to be their God. That's the original covenant of redemption, you recall. Right there we are. That is the essence of what God wants. He wants to be our God. He wants us to be his people. And we can be in that relationship with him in a more intimate way, the better we keep the covenant. And a mark of your spiritual life is your prayer life. Do you really want to be in contact with God? Is he really valuable enough to you that he's your God that you pray and communicate with him? Private prayer, also corporate prayer. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is God's plan from the beginning, from the garden. That was his plan. And that's what Genesis 3.15 was all about. A seed is going to come. It's going to return you to a garden atmosphere. I will be their God and they will be my people. God's plan. Verse 34. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Now, what's he saying here? Well, in the old covenant, the people needed a mediator they needed a, a priest or a, a levite to come teach them uh, but now through the new covenant through regeneration and transformation through 
Christ died on the cross and, and clean in our temple, basically, now God can come into us in an intimate way via the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about here. We will know the law now. We will know God. We, I don't need somebody to tell me about him in that sense. That doesn't mean we still don't need teachers to teach the scripture, but you will, by regeneration, you know God exists now, right? Versus a non-believer who believes in evolution. If you're a believer, you should, that should not even be a question in your mind because you know God exists. You know, I talk about the seven wraps. How do you wrap your mind around creation? You know he created the world. How he did it? By a word. How about the wrap of sustaining your life today, everything you do today, your breath, Acts 17, by the grace of God. And how do you wrap your head around the incarnation? Do you believe that? How do you wrap your head around a perfect life? How do you wrap your head around the cross? Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it's a weakness of God, it's his strength. People can't grasp that idea that God would come and die on a cross. So if you've been born again, you know these things. That's what he's talking about here, the resurrection. You know that there's going to be an eternal life down the road, a new heavens and new earth. Nobody has to teach you those things if you understood the gospel. And then we have the second part of verse 34 there, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Now, that is what the Mosaic Covenant couldn't do. This is part of the New Covenant. Hebrews elaborates on this, and we may touch on Hebrews next week, but the Old Testament sacrificial system just covered the sins. It was forgiveness on credit. And when Jesus comes, the credit card is paid off. By his death, he sacrificed his life for me, for you, and he went into the grave for three days, but because he didn't commit any sin, God said, what are you doing down there? And rose him up. And he became then a substitute for each of us. But his perfect life would not, death couldn't hold him. That's why he could raise again. And in union with him, our it, Paul tells us in Romans 6, we're baptized with him. We die with him. Our sins are dead with him. And we rise again. We rise justified. So our sins now have been forgiven. And this is, I mean, I don't know how the people, when they wrote, read that, what they would have thought. Because they were going year after year after year to sacrifice these animals. And blood ran everywhere. And all the sand, the sand, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. That's justification by faith. I mean, that's a marvelous, marvelous statement. It's the fulfillment of the covenant of works. Okay? Because if our sins are forgiven, how do we stand justified before God? By Christ keeping the covenant of works. And our sins are not credited to us. It's covered of grace. Our sins will forgive no more. All right. This is what the Lord says. Now, I want you to keep in mind here a couple things. As we're going down through here, you notice, I will, I will, I will. It's no more, I will. It's God will. God's making these promises, and he keeps them. That's what the Old Testament reflects. This is what the Lord says, verse 35. And this is an allusion to the creation, an allusion to the Noahic covenant. You see all these, all these covenants are mixed in here. A lot of them are in here. I'm going to show you the Davidic covenants over here in verse 30. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, there's creation idea, who decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stares up the sea so the waves roar. The Lord is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. So this is the promise, the eternal promise, if you will. So this is sort of a fulfillment of the Noahic covenant, the creation covenant. God's created a world. It's not going to go away. It's not going to disintegrate. It's going to stay put. And God's going to see to it that it stays put. 
This is what the Lord says in verse 37. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundation of the earth below searched out will I reject the descendants because of what all they have done, declares the Lord. So, what God's promising here is an eternal covenant. It's not going to go away. This is the new heavens and the new earth. This is looking forward to Revelation. And this covenant will be established forever. It's not going any place. I don't know what they thought when they read it, but we know what we was thinking. Now, verse 38, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when this city will be rebuilt for me from the Tower of Annabel to the corner gate. The measuring line will stretch from the, there straight to the hull of Gareb and then turn to Goa. The whole valley where dead bodies and ashes are thrown and all the terraces out to the Kidron Valley on the east as far as the corner of the horse gate will be holy to the Lord. The city never again will be uprooted or demolished. So this is an allusion to the new heavens, I mean, to the new Jerusalem. And this part of this, we see when Greg taught ne Nehemiah, this is where they started building the wall. So that was a type of the new Jerusalem that God has already started. You remember in Revelation, the new Jerusalem is descending as I speak. So as we go through here, we see that God is establishing a people. He's they're going to be forgiveness. He's going to write the law in their hearts and their minds through regeneration. He's going to establish it forever. And he's already started building this new temple. So this is part of what Isaiah, I mean, what Jeremiah is alluding to here. Now, there's one other chapter I want to go to, one other book I want to go to. We talk about the New Covenant in the Old Testament today, and that's Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel, if you will, if you have your Bible there, to 36. And again, Greg talked through this some time ago, but I think in context of our teaching today, I think it's important to look at this chapter as well. Because remember, I told you that the prophets, when they came on board, they were mostly speaking about judgment. <clears throat> and it's these cryptic passages scattered out in all the prophets, basically, which allude to these new things God's going to do. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a time when I, I like to kind of talk about connecting the dots, if you will, you know, going from the covenant of redemption and Ephesians down to where Adam had the law perfectly, but he fell and God established these, all these other covenants. And now through the new covenant, he's bringing all these covenants to a climax again. And this was alluded to back in the Old Testament, and they didn't necessarily understand it. But now if we look back at it, we see it in its beauty, <clears throat> like we just saw Jeremiah. Ezekiel is very similar. And if you look at Ezekiel chapter 36, <clears throat> verse 24, again, for I will, you see the I will there, for I will take you out of the nations. Now, when we, when we think about that, you remember that in the new covenant, Israel and Judah, which we talked about, God's taking people out of all the tribes and nations. I'll take you out of the nations. This is, he's, he's again alluding to the covenant, the new covenant community here, not necessarily just Israel. And this, I think, is a, is a little conflict between covenant theology, which I think is, a, is an appropriate one, and dispensational theology. I will take you out of the nations. This is the covenant community. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Now, what land is he talking about? Well, when Jesus comes on board, which we'll talk about in more detail next week, <clears throat> you know, what did he say? He sent the disciples out to make disciples of all nations. And when we make disciples of all nations, it's, it's no longer a geopolitical little area in Israel. He's talking about the whole world. And that's, and Jesus knew that. And Jesus knew that he was to be a light to the Gentiles to call them in. We see this as we look through the scripture. And when Jesus said, you know, the meek inherit the earth, this is what we're getting at here. The people God's calling out of the nations are going to be called out to inherit the world. Romans 4 talks about that. I will sprinkle clean water on you. That's regeneration. And you will be clean. You see, when God moves his spirit into your heart, he sprinkles that clean water. He makes you that new man. That's why his Holy Spirit can dwell with you in some mysterious way we don't understand, but he can influence us and dwell with us because we've been sprinkled clean. 
I will clean you from all your impurities and all your idols. Well, that's a mouthful. I'm still struggling with some idolatry myself, aren't you? Yeah. But he's working on it, you see. It's a progressive sanctification. That's why justification is not the end. Justification is the beginning of the new man. Sanctification is the cleansing and the purifying of that, uh, keeping that new man clean and purified. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. You see, that's Jeremiah, when we get to regeneration. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and keep my laws carefully. You will live in the land I will give your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. So there's the formula once again, the covenant formula. I will be your God and you will be my people. And you will follow my degrees. You see, so, and Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? If, if you abide the bond, you'll bear fruit. People know who you are by the fruits you bear. So the, the church today is challenged to be fruit bearing. And one thing we have to keep in mind, just like what happened to Israel, Israel was a type. And what happened to Israel? The people got on a slippery slope and started worshiping other things and weren't keeping the Shema. Same thing with us. If we are on a slippery slope and false gods come into our church or false teachers come into our church, they start teaching stuff that's not biblical. We're on a slippery slope. And the next thing you know, we won't be following God's decrees and God's law. Best I understand, and I might go out on a limb and make somebody mad, but the Old Testament says homosexuality is an abomination. And the New Testament says the same thing. What are we supposed to do about that? That's God's law and God's decree. So he's put a heart in us, a regenerated heart, to keep God's law and keep God's decree. <clears throat> I will save you from your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful. See there? That's, that's the idea of blessing. I will save you from, okay, uh, I will increase the fruit of the trees, the crops of the fields, so you no longer suffer disgrace among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds and so on. So by keeping God's laws and keeping God's decrees, we bring blessing. And that's what the church is supposed to do. What has the church done through the centuries? Has it not done that? The church took care of people during the Black Plague. The church has always sent people in where there's devastation and illness. The churches have been instrumental in establishing orphanages, hospitals. The church today still is on the first line. A lot of times when there's devastation, like hurricanes, like our church went down to uh, when Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. Uh, churches have always been involved in mission work, hospital work, charity work. So this is where the witness is. The church's witness is not in power. The church's witness is in weakness and grace and taking care of suffering and disease. And let's go over one more chapter here. Chapter 37, <clears throat> if you will. Verse 24, my servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. Now, what do you think people read about when they read that? You know, they think David's going to come back. I mean, who is this David, this shepherd? David's been dead hundreds of years. <clears throat> they will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your fathers lived, they and their children, and the children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be the prince. Get this, I will make a covenant of peace. This is an allusion to, synonymous with, the new covenant. He calls it the covenant of peace. Isaiah calls it an everlasting covenant. Whenever you read that, it's all the same thing. I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. They're, you know, this is what he's talking about back here in Ephesians. My chosen people I'm going to call out. To worship me. I will put my sanctuary among them forever. Jesus came. He's gone back to the right hand, but he's coming again. Revelation says we will dwell with God forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. There's the, the main verse again. The nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. So that's the new heavens. The new earth, the new Jerusalem, Mount Zion. This is the end of the book of Revelation. God's going to come. He'll be the light. We'll no longer need the sun or the moon. God will dwell with us forever. We'll be his people. 
question is, how are we doing in that regard now? Peter tells us that the church also now is a holy priesthood, a holy nation. And we're also a witnessing nation. We're the new Israel. When Jesus came out and called the 12 apostles, he's reconstituted Israel. From the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, salvation came from the Jews, from the 12 apostles. The church has been growing like a mustard seed ever since. And this church now is a holy priesthood. It's supposed to be doing what Israel is supposed to do, but couldn't, but we're empowered to do. And the church that's doing what it's supposed to do is witnessing to God the way they should. So when people come into our church, what do they see? Do they see a people here that are overjoyed with what God's done for them? A people that is, I mean, what's the response to a God that's done all this? What's the proper response to a God that's done what he's done? If you remember the raps I told you, creation, sustaining, providential sustaining, the incarnation, the perfect life, the cross, the resurrection, he's regenerated you. What's the response to a person that has experienced all that because of the new covenant? There's only one response. You worship. You enjoy God. If somebody does something nice for you, if somebody, what do you do? You thank them. You don't throw mud in their face. You say, gee whiz, thanks for bringing me that meal. Thanks for helping me with my broken down car. Thanks for this or that. Well, look what God's done for you. What's the response? That's my question to you today. Are you thankful? Are you grateful? It even goes beyond that. It goes to worship. And by glorifying God, which is what he requires, you're glorifying yourself as well because you're in his image. So I'm going to end here. And if there's any questions, you can shoot. Next week, I'll conclude the New Covenant by looking at the New Testament, specifically Jesus and his inauguration and fulfillment of the New Covenant. And we'll look at him in more detail. It reminds me of a little boy who's, I don't know if I quote this joke right, but the little boy was asking Sunday school a question. You know, he thought hard and hard and thought, so well, I don't know for sure, but I think the answer is Jesus. And that's what we're going to look at next week, Jesus. And now he is the fulfillment of the New Covenant. And we'll, again, use various texts. So, does anybody have a question there, Tim? Okay. So, we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll close and get prepared to come and worship this God that established this new covenant before the foundation of the world and has brought it to fulfillment in Jesus. Lord, we're thankful for showing us all this in your word. We're thankful that it's just overwhelming to us. And uh, it, it's embarrassing how little we study it to appreciate how much you've done. So we pray this morning that as we come to the service, we'll come to worship. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus who fulfilled every single one of the promises you've made. And since his name we pray, amen. Over.